Nice. This is getting to be quite a routine, isn't it? We have to stop eating like this. But on the hot seat today is my colleague, who uh, is coming up for reappointment as assistant professor. Mike got his PhD in biology and biochemistry from the University of Bath in the UK. He then went on to do postdoctoral studies at King's College in London. Um, he was there. there he was in the Department of Medical and Molecular Genetics. During his final year at King's College, he was awarded the London Law Trust Medal Fellowship. So in preparation for this talk, I figured I'd better look up the London Law Trust Medal Fellowship and know a little bit about it. Uh, so I, I googled London Law Trust Fellow, and what did I get? Michael Howard. <laughs> 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 so that was the first thing I thought of, is that Mike made this up. <laughs> but I, I probed a little bit deeper, and, and what I did learn was that it's, it is a legitimate award uh, given at King's College. It's actually quite prestigious, and uh, it's provided to young investigators, postdoctoral scholars, to facilitate their independence, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically providing the resources to establish a program to have people working for him and addressing an issue that is of particular interest to him rather than working for someone else on their particular research project. What was that? So, yep. so anyway, very prestigious and we're very fortunate to get Mike. He joined us in 2014, uh, again as an assistant professor. He was hired as part of a cluster, the uh, Environmental Health Sciences Cluster. And accordingly, not only is he a member of our department, but he's a member in good standing of the Center for Human Health and the Environment. Mike's research interests are in understanding how environmental factors, such as nutrition, chemical exposures, uh, affect epigenetic modifications, and what the consequences of those modifications are. The topic of his talk is epigenetic responses, the developmental environment. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for Laura coming along this afternoon. Can everybody hear me clearly? I think I'm right. um, so yes, I'm just approaching the two-year anniversary of having joined NC State, and I really enjoyed interacting and getting to know uh, many of the faculty here, so thanks. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit today about the uh, research that we've started in the lab uh, over the last two years, and I suppose we've really only had a functional lab for something like 15 or 16 months. Um, so really a lot of what I'm going to tell you about is establishing models for asking this question, as Jerry said, about how the environment uh, and impact on the epigenome and then the impacts and consequences of this for health in later life. So if we can get our head around the table. So um, I guess we've seen slides like this before and we're all familiar with this concept that uh, the environment that we're exposed to during our early life can influence our growth and our development and ultimately our health in later life. So we think a lot about factors like diet or parental diet, uh, endocrine disruptors or toxic metals, um, drugs, whether these are prescription or something more illicit, um, parental nurturing or psychological stress. All of these factors can feed in to influence our growth and development. And of course, we can't forget the contribution of genetics to this process, 
Um, so some people are more susceptible to environmental stresses than others. So exposure to these kinds of uh, factors in early life can uh, feed forward and influence our metabolic health as adults. Um, so we are familiar with this idea of early life programming affecting obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, all these big complex disorders that we uh, talk about as well. A key point that I want to make from this slide though is that you know, historically we focused a lot on the importance of the prenatal environment for this type of programming effect. But I think it's really important to consider that development continues after birth. And um, postnatal development is a critical time period during which there's a lot of growth, there's still cell differentiation, a lot of, um, a lot of neurogenesis is taking place. So this is still a key, uh, critical window of um, potential susceptibility. So I just want to think a little bit about the mechanisms that could be responsible for this kind of programming effect. And as an example, because we're going to talk a little bit more about this later, I want to use the concept of maternal overnutrition to illustrate this idea. So uh, we know that maternal overnutrition um, can influence the growth and development of the embryo, uh, and also potentially um, during postnatal life, and this can program a whole host of metabolic disorders, things like high blood pressure, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, um, changes to adipose tissue accumulation and insulin resistance, uh, which we refer to just collectively as the metabolic syndrome. It's an all-encompassing term which prevents us from having to deal with details. So my lab is really interested in this question of how, um, like what is the mechanism of this programming um, effect? So how is it that an exposure in early life can lead to um, all of these metabolic syndromes in later life? And so we propose that there has to be some kind of molecular mechanism underpinning this. And so we're really interested in this idea of a mechanism of memory. There has to be some way of remembering uh, what your exposure was in utero or in early postnatal development, and then 50 or 60 years later, you end up with type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular disease. And I think there are a whole host of different molecular mechanisms that probably contribute to this program effect. Uh, some of them I mentioned here, so the microbiome, for example, I think could act as some kind of memory of exposure, um, other types of molecular changes like oxidative stress, and of course epigenetics. And I think it would be naive to assume that uh, one of these is solely responsible for this programming effect. I think they probably all work together to contribute um, to developmental programming. But in any case, my lab is uh, particularly interested in the involvement of epigenetics in this process. So what's the problem really with, uh, or what are the problems in the field for um, studying developmental programming? So the first is trying to elucidate this mechanism for memory, as we talked about. The second is trying to uh, distinguish between different windows of susceptibility. So that's coming back to this idea that, um, that I talked about, where not only prenatal exposure, but also postnatal exposure could be important programming of in later life. Also, what are the functional significance of these epigenetic changes? So uh, we see a lot of papers that report you know, change in DNA methylation of this particular gene as a consequence of exposure. But uh, what does that actually mean in terms of impacts on gene transcription or protein levels? Uh, you know, what are the functional um, effects of these epigenetic changes? <clears throat> Another key question in the field is this idea of common response pathways. So we know that uh, maternal overnutrition, also low protein diet during the neutral development, exposure to various endocrine disruptors like EPA, toxic metals, all of these different types of exposure can actually feed into uh, call similar phenotypes in adulthood. So similar metabolic phenotypes like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, for example. So we propose that there has to be, or there may be some kind of common pathway through which many of these um, environmental stressors, as we call them, may act. Uh, but it's not really clear what the, um, this common pathway the final issue is this, I guess this is a super hot topic in the field at the moment, that's differentiating between the influence of the developmental environment and the germline in uh, these programming events. So you can imagine that if you're developing as um, an embryo in the womb, then you're exposed to a maternal environment which could influence your growth. Uh, but there's increasing evidence that actually some information about the environment is transmitted through the germline. So actually maybe you already inherit information from your, uh, from your mother through the oocyte. Uh, there's also evidence that you can inherit some kind of epigenetic information about the environment through the paternal line, so through spirit. So uh, my lab has not really got to addressing this question yet, but I think this is an area that um, we can grow into over the next few years, which I think would be quite exciting. So there are several barriers to studying these problems in humans, and some of them are pretty obvious. The first one is time. It's pretty hard to study 
uh, developmental programming in humans because it takes many decades. Uh, and then there's also this big issue of tissue availability. So um, a lot of studies with humans will use what we call surrogate tissues, so things like bubble swabs or um, blood samples to measure epigenetic changes or um, other types of molecular changes. The question is how relevant are these to um, tissues that may be more clinically relevant, so things like liver, for example. Could there be a mismatch between those two? The same type of problem is also the case for doing functional studies. So often we don't have RNA from human samples, or we certainly don't have RNA from the right tissues in order to ask how epigenetic changes could actually be, um, the consequences of epigenetic changes on gene expression, for example. And of course, human populations have a lot of genetic and environmental heterogeneity, which makes interpreting some of these findings very difficult. So enter our weapon of choice, the mouse, uh, which basically enables us to overcome each of these barriers uh, to study development. So the kinds of broad questions that my lab are interested in, and really we're pecking away at smaller parts of these questions still, but um, really the broad questions are, what are the relative contributions of different windows of exposure uh, to the programming of metabolic health? So for example, pre versus post exposure. How do these different windows of exposure program the epigenome? And we suspect that they have different impacts on the epigenome, even if you have the same exposure during different time windows. Then what are the consequences of these epigenetic changes on things like gene transcription, cell biology, uh, and ultimately physiology? So really this is the mechanistic link between these two questions. And then as I said, we want to uh, lead on to understanding uh, a little bit more about how the germline may contribute to uh, development of the So research in my lab is split between three main projects, and I want to guide you through um, each of these projects in turn. So I'll start with uh, this project that we've developed on maternal overnutrition. So let's get back to this slide. Uh, remember I told you that maternal overnutrition during, um, during development can influence a whole raft of uh, metabolic um, factors. Uh, and so we focus specifically on uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as our physiological endpoint. Uh, so this is a project that's being led by um, Mathine Baptizar, who's the postdoc working in my lab. Uh, and she's also the one responsible for the artwork on the front page. Uh, and so non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is basically a progression of um, diseases, or a progression of physiology, I suppose. <laughs> Starting with steatosis, which is the accumulation of excess lipid um, in the liver, uh, leading through steatohepatitis to ultimately cirrhosis in the liver. So it's a, a disease progression. I just want to quickly guide you through the pathogenesis of NAFLD, because I think it's going to be relevant for um, how we interpret some of the data later. So um, in the early stages of NAFLD, what we see is an increase in lipid uptake, an increase in um, free fatty acid uptake, and an increase in de novo lipogenesis. Okay, these are the sort of first hallmarks, I suppose, of this process of NAFLD. Uh, so what you end up with is just increased uh, lipid deposition in the liver. Then over time, this starts to progress, uh, and we get increases to beta oxidation, which uh, ultimately result in um, inflammation. So we get recruitment of various inflammatory mediators, and so you start to see inflammation in the liver, uh, and then uh, this beta oxidation also drives increased lipid peroxidation and ultimately um, apoptosis in the liver. And then in the final stages, we get activation of hepatic stellate cells, which um, essentially cause fibrosis, and we get collagen being deposited in the liver, and that's what you can see in these um, stages. <coughs> Okay, so while the pathogenesis of NAFLD is really well described, I mean, we know a lot about the molecular mechanisms and the evolution of this uh, disease. What's really not clear are the mechanisms that link maternal overnutrition to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in the offspring. And this is really a key question to try to address. Uh, at the same time, we also want to understand um, this idea of whether prenatal or postnatal development is really the critical, say, uh, their relative contributions to the development of non-alcoholic is one of these periods more critical. So this is a model that we've developed. Um, so we use inbred mouse strains, C57 black 6, and we have uh, females who are exposed to either a controlled diet or a high fat diet for six weeks. And then we mate these with controlled males, uh, and so we have basically embryos from two groups. So at birth we have two groups, those born to uh, controlled females and those born to uh, high fat diet. Now, because we want to differentiate between prenatal and postnatal exposure, what we do is take a subset of these individuals and cross-foster them at birth, 
And so now we end up with four different groups where we have those who are exposed to a high fat diet specifically during postnatal life, those specifically during prenatal life, and then we have uh, the more, might consider to be the more extreme uh, exposure during both pre and postnatal life, as well as, of course, uh, unexposed controls. And then our idea is to um, perform a variety of phenotypic analyses at three different time points uh, from each of these groups, so at birth, weaning, and in adulthood. And we're interested in trying to correlate these with changes in gene transcription, so trying to understand some of the molecular uh, changes here in terms of gene network activation and ultimately epigenetic um, mechanisms of this. So we have a lot of data from uh, this study, and I, I don't really have time to go through everything, but I just want to show you a few so the first thing is to think about body mass, which is on the left hand side here. So at birth, uh, remember we only have two groups, those born to control and those born to back our diet moms, and essentially we see no change in birth weight either. But when we get to weaning, what we see is that individuals exposed to uh, maternal high fat diet, specifically during postnatal development, or during both pre and postnatal development, show a significantly elevated body weight. But that's not the case for those exposed only during prenatal development. So it seems like there are different um, time windows here that have uh, different impacts on the feed. This kind of pattern is also mirrored when you look at the um, wet weights of uh, specific tissues. So here, for example, we see an increase in retroperitoneal and canal white adipose tissue um, mass, again, specifically following postnatal exposure or exposure to pre and postnatal development, but not prenatal exposure. Now, what's interesting is that um, these phenotypes actually disappear when we get to adulthood. Right? So here, uh, this is showing postnatal day 99, and you can see the body mass, as this body mass differences have essentially disappeared. Retroperitoneal, white adipose tissue, gonadal, these have disappeared. So there's been a normalization over time. So this isn't really a kind of true uh, developmental programming model, I suppose, because we're essentially losing that phenotypes over time, and I'll come back to that. So since we're interested in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we better look at the liver. And uh, one way that we do that is with histology. And so um, here we've stained uh, liver sections with oil red O, which basically picks up um, deposits of lipid in the liver. And so at weaning, which is across the uh, top line here, uh, these are controlled individuals where you can see very little lipid uh, stored in the liver. Um, that's, you see a slightly more, uh, or slightly increase in uh, lipid deposition in individuals exposed to high-fat diet during prenatal development, but clearly the strongest phenotypes are following postnatal development or exposure during both windows. So a similar kind of effect to what we were seeing with body mass and white had post tissue mass. So to correlate with uh, what we were talking about with um, phenotypes disappearing into adulthood, for most individuals, by the time we get to postnatal day 99, uh, the lipid deposited in the liver has all but disappeared. So this guy looks pretty similar to the control. There are a subset of individuals, however, who, um, well, who in this, this final group of double exposure, pre and postnatal development, where the lipid deposition seems to persist into uh, And so um, we're working with David Reif and uh, his PhD student, Kim, to try to understand uh, why there are some individuals who may be more susceptible to uh, this program of non alcoholic fatty disease, even though we've controlled for as many different variables as we can, like litter size, um, sex ratio, and so uh, this is just a quantification of what we're seeing here since oil red oil is not especially, uh, not especially quantitative approach. We've also um, measured liver triglyceride accumulation. Um, and again, we see uh, this pattern reproduced. Uh, and it pretty much disappears at adulthood, except for these two individuals, which are shown here, uh, who clearly have excess deposition of lipid. So we've also done a lot of, um, you know, so this is kind of at the phenotypic level, and we really now want to drill down into what's going on in terms of gene transcription changes and then ultimately epigenetics. And so we've done a lot of gene expression studies here, and I'm just going to show you um, a little bit of information uh, about this. And really this is uh, partly to determine uh, how far we progress through this pathogenesis of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Where are we on this spectrum? So uh, we see increases, uh, this is a, a weaning by the way, so we see increases in expression of DPAR alpha, which is a key gene involved in um, fatty acid uptake and uh, catabolism. And we also see increases in uh, CPT2, which is a gene involved in beta oxidation. So we've definitely reached the steatosis phenotype here, uh, postnatal day 21. We also see some uh, inflammatory mediators being upregulated. 
um, but the data are not kind of completely consistent. So I think we're probably somewhere uh, in between steatosis and steatohepatitis on this uh, spectrum. So really we need to um, be more comprehensive in our transcription profiling, so we're planning to do RNA sequence with these samples and then really get on to understanding what are the epigenetic changes that could be responsible for these uh, gene transcription profiles. So I mentioned that most of the phenotypes disappear uh, when we reach out them. So we thought we would um, modify this model slightly and make it a more of an impactful environmental stressor. So you might remember from last time that we um, fed animals either a control or a high fat diet for just six weeks. So in this modified experimental um, strategy, we expose them for 60 weeks. So here the uh, mothers in the system, not only are they overweight, but they also show some early indications of diabetes. So it's a more kind of extreme environmental exposure. We do the same cross-fostering strategy again, um, but this time we also um, wean a subset of the animals onto a high fat diet. And so this is we're considering as a second hit. So this will help, in our, um, in our minds, kind of exaggerate or exacerbate some of the effects that we're seeing from um, exposure either during prenatal or postnatal. And so this is kind of hot off the press. I got these data yesterday, so I'm um, super excited about this. Uh, so these are um, phenotypic data, basically, from adulthood. And whereas before we were seeing these phenotypes disappear by the time we get to adulthood, this time we see that they are persisting and uh, clearly there are deficiencies in the ability of um, animals to respond to um, a shot of glucose or respond to a shot of insulin. So basically they're kind of on the road to becoming diabetic. And I think we need to do some more analysis to actually determine whether it really is a diabetic phenotype. But what's particularly striking about, um, I guess in particular, this insulin tolerance test uh, is that, again, it's individuals who are exposed during postnatal development who show the most dramatic phenotype suggesting that this may be a more critical window of susceptibility to maternal undernutrition than prenatal development. Okay, so I just want to finish this part of the talk um, by looking at a kind of spin-out project that I suppose has evolved from uh, this maternal undernutrition study. <coughs> so for a while I've been very interested in uh, genomic imprinting, and for those who are less familiar with that, I'll give a short primer on imprinting in, in a moment. Um, and uh, imprinted genes are, we know that they play critical roles in growth and development and also in adult metabolism. And so we sort of wanted to ask what's happening to imprinted genes in our system where we're having a maternal nutrition. So uh, imprinted genes are expressed as part of a network and they're regulated by this zinc finger transcription factor called ZAC1. Actually, the gene that encodes ZAC1 also happens to be. So I think probably most people are familiar with imprinting, but um, if you're not so familiar, I'll just give you a quick overview. So uh, imprinting basically refers to genes that are expressed from only one parental allele, and this always depends on the parent of origin. So of course you inherit two copies of each gene, one from mom, one from dad, and in the majority of cases, like in this green gene here, uh, they're both expressed and they both contribute to some kind of phenotype. There are a subset of genes in both mouse and human, uh, actually some, some plants as well, uh, that are expressed from only one of the alleles, and this always depends on which allele we're talking about. So this red gene is always expressed from the maternal allele, and it's transcriptionally repressed on the paternal allele. And the reciprocal is true. This, this is regulated by epigenetic mechanisms that are established differentially in the germlines. Uh, so for example, for this maternally expressed gene, the promoter is hypomethylated, and this was a uh, genetic profile or the setup in the oocyte, uh, whereas conversely, on the paternal allele, where it's transcriptionally silent, it's hypermethylated. And again, this was set up in mutagenesis, and then a cell, as cells have gone through um, cell division, uh, this kind of memory of which parent they've been derived from has persisted. So these sequences are referred to as imprinting control regions. And that's not critical for this part of the talk, but I will definitely come back to that. Okay, so actually what happens to the expression of ZAC1 and some of the other genes in this transcriptional network when we expose individuals to maternal nutrition? So if we look at ZAC1, um, its expression profile kind of mirrors what we see at the phenotypic level, right? So we're seeing an upregulation of ZAC1 uh, specifically in individuals exposed during postnatal development and in individuals exposed during both pre- and postnatal development, but not prenatal development. Now this is kind of interesting because um, 
imprinted genes tend to get repressed after birth, so their expression level should drop off. But here what we're seeing is that when you expose individuals to overnutrition after birth, somehow this is maintaining, um, to some extent at least, the expression of this imprinted gene network. So we're kind of really excited about this, and we want to know more about uh, what this is actually doing in the context of our model. I've just shown two examples here of a couple of genes that are um, in this network that show the same kind of expression. Not everybody behaves in quite the same way, but there are several others that also show this expression. So, for a start, we don't really know what SAC1 and the imprinted gene network are doing in the liver. So this is going to be one of our first questions, is to figure out what's the, the function of this network in, in normal, uh, normal liver context. And then we want to understand more about why maternal liver nutrition, specifically in postnatal development, uh, causes a pump regulation of this network. And so this is a collaboration that we're working with uh, Laurent Journeau, who... Uh, okay, so just to summarize this part of the talk, um, we've established a model, basically, in mice to study the effects of maternal overnutrition on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And one of the strengths, I think, of this model is that we comp can compare pre- and postnatal um, exposure periods. And we've definitely demonstrated some phenotypes and some gene expression patterns that appear to be unique depending on the window. So moving forward, we need to uh, perform some more global analyses of gene expression and really start to get at some of the underlying epigenetic mechanisms that might program some of these uh, effects of the scene. Uh, we're also working on this spin-off project on ZAC1 for the MPG. Okay, so I want to come now and talk a little bit about this project on endocrine disruptors and epigenetics. And this, I say, would say is the, the least developed in the lab, so I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about it, and then we'll move on to the, uh, the final project. But I just want to give you an introduction to you know, the system that we're using and some of the questions that we want to ask. So we've all heard about endocrine disruptors. They're everywhere around us, and they've been implicated in a whole bunch of um, etiologies, so obesity, cancer, developmental um, abnormalities, uh, neurological abnormalities, behavior, and so on. And uh, many of these, um, I guess, etiologies are mediated through epigenetic changes. That's been pretty well established in the literature. Now, it turns out that um, you know, a whole range of studies actually have shown this, that imprints and control regions seem to be particularly sensitive to uh, endocrine disruptors, getting reprogrammed at the epigenetic level. So remember, imprint and control regions are those sequences that are differentially methylated uh, on the two parental families. And this seems to be linked to a loss of imprinting. So for example, you get reactivation of the allele that is normally um, epigenetically silent. Now it's not really clear why these imprinting control regions, or what we call ICRs, are particularly susceptible to endocrine disruptors. But one hypothesis is that um, during early development, they have a very unique DNA methylation dynamic, I suppose. So what happens after fertilization is that uh, the majority of the genome, both the paternal and the maternal genome, uh, gets demethylated. And so you kind of get down to a basal level by the time you reach a blastocyst where uh, new epigenetic marks can be established according to which somatic cell lineage the cell is going to go down. Imprinting control regions, uh, if you think about it, they have to survive this reprogramming event because by the time you get to here, you still have to remember whether you came from a maternal copy or a paternal copy. So imprinting control regions survive this genome-wide, otherwise genome-wide DNA demethylation event. And so it's been suggested that um, you know, this period is, makes them particularly sensitive to endocrine disruptors. And we know a little bit, but not very much, about the molecular basis of this protection. One key challenge to studying how endocrine disruptors might impact the system is that it's pretty hard to do this in mice, to study very early developmental processes. So what we decided to do was to basically take cells from this stage, so uh, cells from the inner cell mass, so essentially culture, embryonic stem cells in a dish, uh, that still retain the protection of the imprinting control regions, and basically you know, shoot these with endocrine disruptors and ask what happens to uh, methylation patterns and uh, imprinting transcription. Uh, so this is a collaboration with um, Mike Berriman, and it's a project that's being led by Christine in my lab with some help from Jesse, who is an undergrad, uh, who joined the lab. And the basic uh, experimental design is very straightforward. We culture embryonic stem cells in a dish. We expose them to some kind of endocrine disruptor. And then we isolate uh, DNA for epigenetic analysis, RNA for transcript analysis, and 
ultimately we want to ask if these changes are having an impact on protein levels, and that's where Michael comes in with that step. So Christine has uh, extended this study design now to include interactions between multiple different endocrine disruptors. And uh, as I said, this project is still really in, in development. Uh, we have cells culturing, which is a, a bonus. They have the correct number of chromosomes, which is great, because if you have the wrong number of chromosomes in imprinting studies, then it's going to completely mess up your, your dosage and your measurements. And so really the value of setting up this model is twofold. I think the first is that it enables us to study a bit more the protection mechanism what keeps imprinting control regions protected from uh, DNA demethylation, and how then these might be affected by endocrine disruptors. And I think the other thing we can do is ask whether uh, these epigenetic changes that endocrine disruptors impart, are they actually protected through cell differentiation? So if you drive these embryonic stem cells down various uh, somatic cell-like lineages, uh, then are these epigenetic changes persistent? Uh, the other thing I want to tell you about this model is that we're using a quite a unique genetic system here. So we haven't just taken embryonic stem cells that are commonly grown in the lab, um, we've actually got them from a hybrid between two divergent mouse strains. Now the rationale for doing this is it will really help us to study um, imprinted genes that we can look at allele-specific methylation and allele-specific expression. So this is the phylogeny of the 94 uh, mouse HAPMAP strains, and the two strains that we've crossed together are C57 black 6 and uh, Japanese fancy males born down here. So these are both inbred strains, but they're very highly divergent. And this means that there are about 11 and a half million steps between these two strains. And so what we do um, is now we cross these together and then take um, uh, embryonic stem cells from uh, these blastocysts. And now we can use single nucleotide polymorphisms to distinguish between the maternal and the paternal copies. And so this is great for DNA methylation analyses at the legitimate DNA level. <laughs> and also for gene expression at the RNA level. So for example, if we see um, an increase in expression of a particular imprinted gene, we can ask whether this is because of a relaxation or a loss of imprinting. Are we seeing the normally silent allele now upregulated and contributing to this um, bigger pool of RNAs? And so this is a collaboration that we've developed also, <laughs> is that from Montpellier as well? Uh, so Robert File, this is a completely independent collaboration uh, to the normal gene now that they're both in. Okay, so the final project I want to tell you about uh, relates to cadmium uh, DNA methylation. So cadmium is this ubiquitous heavy metal that's in the environment, and um, most of the time we can tolerate small amounts of it, but when it gets above a certain threshold, it becomes toxic. And really there are two key routes um, of exposure to uh, cadmium. One is inhalation, and in fact most of the time that's through smoking, but also from air pollution from factory, several factory processes can um, increase cadmium levels in the air. <clears throat> and then the second mechanism is through ingestion. And so uh, cadmium exists in the soil. In this particular instance, it's in water um, that's been contaminated with industrial runoff. And then it gets into crops that are being grown, in this case rice, uh, and so cadmium is ingested through the diet. So these are the primary routes of the exposure. Now, cadmium has been labeled as an endocrine disruptor. It can cause reproductive abnormalities. It can cause infertility. Uh, <clears throat> it's also a carcinogen and has been implicated in a whole bunch of uh, different human cancers. And from our point of view, we also find it interesting because we're interested in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And remember, I told you that uh, several different types of environmental stressors seem to be able to converge on perhaps common molecular pathways to affect things like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or other we know from a whole uh, bunch of studies that cadmium can uh, cause epigenetic changes in various systems, both in vivo and in vitro, and epigenetic mechanisms have been suspected in most of these pathologies. So this project has really come about as a collaboration and a conversation with Catherine Hoyo and uh, David Scar from her lab, and um, she's interested in studying a population of people uh, in Durham County who are exposed to high levels of cadmium and lead and other toxic metals in the soil. Uh, and so um, this is Durham County, and here is this uh, population where you can see individuals who are exposed to high levels of lead here and here, and individuals in red and yellow who are exposed to high levels of cadmium. And so what Catherine has done is to perform whole genome by sulfide sequencing on uh, blood samples of pregnant females. 
And so this is partly because we're also going to perform whole genome by software sequencing on the newborn cord blood samples, and we want to be able to compare uh, maternal blood with newborn. So Catherine very graciously um, gave me access to this whole genome by software sequencing data um, because I have some questions that are somewhat different to um, what she's interested in. And so I looked at essentially where these, um, what I'm going to call differentially methylated regions, these regions of the genome that show differential methylation between controls and uh, individuals exposed to high cadmium. Uh, where are they located in the genome and can we infer anything about the function that these uh, DMRs might so we identified 292 DMRs that are distributed throughout the genome. There's no particular uh, enrichment for any one chromosome. And uh, what I found is that about a third of them intersect with CPG islands. About three quarters are within a kilobase of an annotated gene. And about a third of them are close to annotated transcriptional star sites. Now I think this is kind of a view from way up here, but I think what's useful to take from this information is that DMRs aren't just distributed all over the genome, they seem to be close to things that actually matter. So they're close to promoters, they're within genes, or they're very close to genes. They're close to CPG islands, which normally have some kind of regulatory function. So I think it's a first indication that these may be functionally relevant uh, methylation changes. So since I'm so interested in imprinting, and I had also mentioned to you that uh, imprinting control regions are particularly sensitive to environmental stress, I wanted to ask this question about whether uh, DMRs were enriched close to <coughs> imprinting control regions. So if we were doing this experiment in the mouse, it would be pretty straightforward <coughs> because we know that there are 22 ICRs in the mouse. These have been really well characterized. And we, you know, we've confirmed that they show differential methylation in the germ line, so in sperm versus other sites. Unfortunately, the situation in humans is not quite so clear cut. So I think uh, if we're being conservative, we could say that there are at least 10 ICRs in human. Uh, slightly less conservative answer, maybe 15. I suspect that in 10 or 20 years' time, we'll agree that there are probably 22, because imprinting is very highly conserved between uh, rodents and, and primates. Okay, so how many of these have a DMR uh, close to them? And by close, I'm talking about 100 kb, which is kind of reasonably close. I mean, that's half the size of some genes, so that's not a huge distance. Uh, if you think about this most conservative number, four of these 10 have a DMR close by, and of these 15, six of them have a DMR close by. And so the question is, of course, is this statistically significant? And the answer is yes. Uh, this is highly significant. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense, because if there are, you know, a genome is like 3.2 billion nucleotides, and if there are only 292 uh, differentially methylated regions, the chances of them falling close to one of the 15 imprinted control regions is pretty small. So this is a pretty strong enrichment. It kind of adds weight to this idea that maybe imprinting control regions are more susceptible than other regions of the genome. Uh, these are the imprinted genes that are located close to those six uh, ICRs. Um, what I really like about this is that you can actually explain pretty much all of the phenotypes uh, and diseases associated with cadmium exposure just by altering these genes alone. I'm not suggesting that imprinted <coughs> genes are the answer to everything and they're responsible for all of it. But I think it's kind of an interesting <clears throat> So I guess I just want to uh, focus on one of these genes and show you a little bit more about where the DMR is located, what I think uh, it could possibly be doing, and the impact it may be having on gene transfer. So I'm going to focus on uh, this imprinted gene, GRP10. Um, this also happens to be the gene that I spent my whole PhD working on, so it's kind of nice to come full circle. So this is the GRP10 gene. Um, some of you will be familiar with this kind of display. This is a UCSC screen grab of the locus. And so uh, in the center here, we have various transcripts of the GRB10 gene. And GRB10 is actually transcribed in this direction, so from right to left. So the promoters are located up here. And if we zoom in on this particular region here, uh, I'm quite tall to reach another point. Uh, this is the um, imprinting control region that regulates GRB10 expression. And you'll see that this correlates or overlaps perfectly with this cadmium-associated differentially methylated region. So this DMR, although we were asking how many DMRs are within 100 kb of an ICR, this one actually overlaps exactly. Now what got me quite excited is that not only did the ICR have the DMR overlap, but these also correlate perfectly with um, an alternative transcription initiation site for this gene. So this is what we would consider to be a canonical transcript, <coughs> here, and this is an alternative promoter. 
Okay, fine. So maybe we could say that um, changing methylation patterns of this particular site could influence the ratio of transcripts. But why would we be interested in this? So this is what I spent my PhD doing, uh, looking at the same kind of thing in the mouse. And so GRB10 is actually a slightly complex imprint in that um, it's expressed from both <coughs> parental alleles, but in a tissue-specific and isoform-specific way. So what I mean by that is that uh, there are two canonical transcripts and two uh, alternative promoters. And transcripts um, expressed from this promoter are exclusive to the maternal alley. So they're always maternally expressed. Conversely, transcripts that use this promoter are always expressed from the paternal alley. Okay, so this is kind of a simple imprinting going on. Now, moreover, these are actually expressed in different tissues. And uh, so what we did was to trap the uh, GRB10 gene with this um, LACZ reporter descent. And so this basically reports on sites of endogenous GRB10 expression. And so you can transmit this uh, reported cassette separately, sorry, gene trap, I suppose, separately through the maternal and the paternal lines and ask where GRB10 is being expressed from each of the maternal and paternal lines. So GRB10 is expressed from the maternal allele in the vast majority of tissues in all germ layers, uh, but quite strikingly seems to be missing from most of the central nervous system. Conversely, uh, paternal expression of GRB10, which is from this alternative promoter, seems to be almost exclusively within the CNS and some other peripheral sites. So this is kind of reciprocal expression profile, both in terms of uh, tissue distribution and uh, which isoform is being expressed. Now, not only are they expressed in different places, but these isoforms do completely different jobs in terms of physiology. So the maternal uh, allele of GRB10 regulates growth, both in utero and during postnatal development, and it regulates adult metabolism, so things like glucose regulation. The paternal allele, on the other hand, regulates social behavior, and that kind of fits with the fact that it's expressed in the brain. So if we bring this back around, uh, it turns out that these two alternative promoters, this guy here, which falls um, exactly over the DMR, versus this guy, which is the canonical one downstream, these are the human equivalents of these alternative promoters that we see in our human. So what we might be able to infer from this is that maybe exposure to cadmium is causing a shift in the ratio of these two different isoforms. And we would really love to know more about how this is changing tissue-specific expression patterns and then what kind of function this is having physiologically. The problem is we can't do this in humans because we don't have the right samples for this. And so we're going to set up, or have been setting up, um, an exposure model using the mouse to basically get at some of these questions about whether cadmium um, is causing similar kinds of effects in mice, and if so, what's the effect on transcription, what's the effect on the regulation of imprinting, and can we also see um, tissue-specific effects? So this is the model that we're setting up, and it's, um, it's a developmental exposure model. So the idea here is that not only are we exposing pregnant females that we will analyze, but also we're exposing uh, newborn, or, sorry, we're exposing developing individuals as well. And this will correlate with the fact that we're going to do all genome by software sequencing with Catherine on newborn human samples, and so we'll be able to move back and forth. Again, we're going to use a genetic model which will help us study imprinting. So the embryonic stem cells that I told you about were hybrids between black six and Japanese fancy mouse one. This time we're going to use black six and castaneous, and these are even more divergent. So actually, uh, they have about 20 and a half million steps between them. And so we can use the same principle again to look at um, allele-specific epigenetic marks and allele-specific gene transcription. Okay, the final bit of science that I want to talk to you about um, is also related to cadmium toxicity. And it's really getting at this question of you know, what is the mechanism that, what is the mechanism of action of cadmium? So we know that it can impact on the epigenome, but we don't really understand how uh, it signals uh, through the cell to impact on the epigenome. And so we're going to try to um, have a go at, at answering at least part of that question. So one way that cadmium can impact on the cell is that it can replace zinc in a bunch of different contexts, including in uh, zinc finger transcription factors. And this is because cadmium and zinc have very similar biochemical properties, they're both 2B transition metals, and so they can essentially be uh, interchanged with each other. So we're particularly interested in um, this transcription factor, which is a zinc finger transcription factor called SP1. 
And since we know that cadmium can reduce DNA methylation, and we know that cadmium can reduce uh, DNA methyltransferase gene expression, we want to know how much of this uh, impact is via SP1. So um, a hypothesis is that cadmium disrupts the DNA binding abilities of SP1, causing reduced methyltransferase gene expression, and then this is what's responsible, at least in part, for the reduction in DNA methylation. And this is a project that's being led by Katie Hudson, who is the graduate student on that. So the first question we asked is whether there's any evidence that replacing zinc with cadmium can actually change the structure of this. And so we got in touch uh, with Denis Forch and his postdoc with then. It seems I only collaborated with French people just recently, and I employed one as well. Um, so yeah, uh, so these guys basically do computational modeling, right? And so you can predict what happens to the structure of a protein if you, for example, replace zinc with the other And so this is done in the context of uh, the binding of SP1 to DNA. And what you're looking at are, you know, each color represents basically an interaction between two different amino acid residues in this zinc finger. And on the y-axis, you're basically looking at um, changes in distance between two amino acids over time, and it's like a five nanosecond. Um, so what you have along the x-axis are the three different zinc fingers of SP1, uh, either in the context of zinc or in the context of cadmium. And in most cases, there isn't really much difference between having zinc or having cadmium, zinc, cadmium. But the key difference is here in zinc finger two, where uh, for some reason, this um, distance between a particular cysteine and histidine residue uh, is, at least the movement is significantly reduced in the presence of cadmium. So I think we need a lot to do a lot more work with um, tamium and then, but I think this is an early indication that uh, you know maybe cadmium can actually cause some structural change in the zinc fingers of SP1, which may help explain um, a lot of the impacts that it's having on uh, DNMG expression. So also to um, to support this hypothesis, uh, Katie has done uh, gene expression experiments in a system where we've dosed cells with increasing amounts of cadmium. Uh, so that's moving along the x-axis. I don't know how well you can see these labels across here. Uh, but we're getting increasing doses of cadmium along here. And you can see that this correlates with significant reduction to each of the three DNA methyl transferase genes. This doesn't happen with SP1, but this kind of makes sense if our hypothesis is correct because we suspect that cadmium is affecting SP1 at the protein level, not at the gene expression level. And then, um, consistent with this, we also see a global reduction in the amount of DNA methylation itself. Katie is also really interested in this question of zinc rescue. So if you have cells that have been exposed to cadmium like this, can you then switch out the cadmium for zinc and somehow reverse the epigenetic <coughs> And so again, there's a lot more work to do on this, but some of our early experiments are encouraging, and you can see that um, here where we've, uh, actually, this isn't, you haven't replaced, you haven't taken cadmium and then replaced it with zinc, right, this particular experiment, in a one-to-one -one ratio, okay. So here, I guess we have zinc and cadmium competing for SP1 binding, uh, and we can see some rescue uh, of the DNA methylation changes that are induced by cadmium. So that's kind of incredible. So we have a lot more work to do on this. Uh, one key question, of course, if this hypothesis is correct, is that we should see reduced binding of SP1 to the DNA methyl transferase promoters. And so we are optimizing chip of the moment to test that approach. We also want to use uh, various mutants on the zinc finger in SP1, zinc fingers in SP1, to see uh, whether we can play around with this relationship between how many OK, so in summary, um, we know that uh, we've shown that cadmium-induced DNA methylation changes are enriched around imprinting control regions in maternal blood cells uh, of a human level. And based on what we can infer about the location of these DMRs and uh, what we know about imprinted regulation in mice, we can predict that these are likely to cause changes in uh, imprinted gene expression that may be lost. Catherine has also shown that uh, a subset of ICRs show changes in newborn cord blood DNA, and so we're actually working with Vanell to do a whole genome by software sequencing so that we can also have this unbiased view uh, and ask this question about all of the imprinted control regions. And um, we're working at the moment to establish a mouse model of maternal exposure to cadmium. And I think we're close uh, now to, to, uh, to dose some of these animals. Uh, in this other project, looking at the mechanism of action of cadmium or DNA methylation, 
Uh, we've shown that cadmium can produce DNA methyltransferase expression and global methylation in our cell system. And so we're testing the hypothesis that this is mediated at least in part through this transcription factor enzyme. Okay, so Jerry also asked me to um, just spend a little time talking about some of the collaborations and grants that I've put in, and uh, teaching and publications and all these kinds of things. So um, I want to just sort of display it in this graphical visual format, uh, where I've taken each of the main research themes that's going on in the lab and um, linked them to the various collaborations and uh, grants that have been submitted. And so I've kind of used this traffic light system to indicate whether grants are non-funded, pending, or so I mentioned, I think, this collaboration with David Wright and his PhD student, Kim, to try to understand why um, some individuals in our model system, despite the fact we're trying to control for as much as possible, uh, are more susceptible to developing uh, full-blown NAFLD than other individuals. And so uh, we're doing some modeling with him to try and get at that question. Uh, and this really was the basis of the Ralph Epo Junior Faculty Enhancement Award that I uh, won last year. We've also been working with David Monoman in chemistry to um, try to get a more quantitative output of the types of lipid that we're seeing in our model system. So what lipids are actually being accumulated in the lip samples. And so he has some great technology um, based on that spec uh, that is going to help us quickly address that question. And we actually worked with him to put in a grip proposal with a few other people that was ultimately not successful. I told you about the collaboration with Laurent, uh, working on the ZAP1 and the imprinted gene network. And um, I've also worked with June on this uh, map, kinase, 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 called TAC1, and uh, how this may be um, a kind of bridging point between various environmental stresses and uh, leptin resistance that we see in some of our mouse models. And so I was a collaborator on a CHHE pilot project that was funded um, to address this question, and I'm a co-investigator on an R21 that's Endocrine disruptors and epigenetics. So I told you about this um, experiment using embryonic stem cells and looking at imprinted genes. And this was a collaboration with Michael Berryman. And uh, we were lucky enough to get a pilot project funded to get this off the ground. And I've also been working more recently with Seth and Yoshi to uh, address this question of how endocrine disruptors actually affect mes uh, mesenchymal stem cell differentiation and trying to put epigenetic spins in. And again, uh, we were lucky enough to get that funded this year by the CHG pilot project. For cadmium and DNA methylation, I told you about this computational modeling that we're doing with Denis. Um, a lot of this is a collaboration with Catherine Hoyo because we're trying to compare uh, what we see in mice with some of the data that she has from her human cohorts. And so I have um, an NIEHS K22 Career Development Award at the moment, which is pending. And uh, Katie also just submitted an NRSA to NIEHS based on the SP1 project. I've also started working with Scott really recently on this um, interaction between uh, cadmium exposure and iron development. So we're putting together an R01. And so this is kind of the same information, but in a tabular format, um, with a couple of other things that I wanted to pick out. Um, one is that uh, I was lucky enough to be NC State's nominee for the Sir Arthur Sloan Fellowships, but ultimately they were not funded. And I've also been involved in another couple of um, really fun collaborations, which ultimately turned out to be unsuccessful, um, including this one's the Temple Foundation. That was a fun collaborative effort. In terms of teaching, I've been involved in a whole uh, number of epigenetics lectures, basically, in different courses, in the biological sciences, toxicology, and genetics programs. And uh, this fall, I started teaching human and biomedical genetics, which is a really fun course because uh, you can, unlike kind of quantitative genetics, which is also really cool, but uh, you can show like gruesome images of diseases and this kind of thing, the developmental abnormalities, which students have to develop. Um, as part of this, I've been working with Seth Faith in the Met School to develop this uh, three-class genomics, uh, forensics <laughs> genomics activity uh, with homework assignments as well. And I'm really looking forward to doing this. This will be actually in November. And um, essentially, they work over a period of three classes to try and solve a crime, or at least to deduce enough information to solve a crime. And they'll start by using very traditional forensic techniques and find that they can't discriminate between two different suspects and then we'll introduce them to um, more modern emerging techniques in forensics, so things like next generation sequencing, uh, to, in order to enable them to kind of deduce more information and you know, have some confidence in who was the perpetrator of this crime. So I'm quite excited about that. Uh, something else that's happening, which was actually Reed's idea, I think, from last year, um, he invited in a genetic counselor, and we're going to do the same again, because several of the students have actually shown a real interest in genetic counseling. 
and so I'll have them uh, meet with this council for lunch and, and have um, a discussion. I think also um, an important part of my teaching has been training um, people in the lab. And, uh, we've hosted several undergraduates in the lab. Um, I talked about Jesse, so I haven't shown his picture here. He came up earlier. Uh, but Evelyn is also um, a student in the lab, and he, aside from having stolen my shirt, it seems, <laughs> that particular presentation, he's been, I didn't talk about his work, but he's working on um, the impact of uh, maternal overnutrition on maternal offspring behavioral interactions. And he has some really interesting preliminary data. Uh, Kelly, as well, has been working in my lab over the summer, and she um, was working jointly between my lab and Freya Moatz. CBM to ask questions about the transcriptional basis of so retinal degenerative diseases. And so uh, each of these students has been funded <coughs> either by a CMI student or, or by the Provost Professional Experiences Group. Uh, Katie is the genetic student in my lab, um, and, uh, a genetics PhD student in my lab, and she just completed her prelims actually on Wednesday, so it's super exciting. And then also on the uh, committees for the three other toxicology students, and uh, Mahin is also the postdoc. Uh, okay, finally, publications, um, scholarship at NC State. This was actually a really fun bit to write. Um, just after I got here, actually, I was invited to this um, small group discussion um, exercise at Nesson in Durham, which is now closed down. And this was basically to put people in a room, kind of lock the door, and uh, just let them discuss the evolution of genomic imprint. And it was kind of a fun exercise for them. It was fun for two days, and then by the third day, it was less fun. But anyway, it precipitated out into this kind of interesting uh, theory thing. Uh, and then two other publications that have been wrapping up projects that I started before I moved to NCC. So finally, I just want to thank my um, lab. I'm very lucky to have a very enthusiastic and motivated team of people who have really made this whole thing possible, um, turning this warehouse of a lab into something more functional in a period of just a few months. Um, and I'm also very lucky to have a group of very uh, supportive mentors to help I guess, get this research. So thanks for listening and um, happy to take any of your questions. Fostering itself was playing a role, and whether you consider um, fostering all of your animals even to their same degree. Yes, that's a great question. So I should have said that, but yes, we, we foster everybody. Okay. So even the individuals in the control group get fostered to other mothers in the control group. Um, when I've worked on this before, I've, I've done kind of both approaches, and I've never seen fostering have an obvious effect on growth or clear metabolic parameters, but I'm sure there could be things that are more subtle. So yeah, we do control them. I have as always a couple of questions. Besides the fact, I think you should need more French people in your group. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 I mean, proportionally, it's, it's a big number. So uh, one question is about your experiments with BPA, which uh, you, I understand you're using cells. That's right. And I'm wondering why not exposing the mouse because uh, there is already a lot of information available on the effects of PPA on the mouse in terms of behavior and physiology, led by Heather here and, and Emily Rismond. I mentioned also John Lundberg earlier. Uh, so I don't see the rationale why doing cells by not simply exposing mouse and then looking at, uh, at tissues, at methylation in mouse tissues, like for example, if you like the liver, the, which is a nice organ. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's true. We could absolutely do that. I mean, I think part of the rationale is that we're really interested in those early um, molecular events that seem to protect imprinting control regions from demethylation. And so it's kind of difficult to study, at least for us, to study that early developmental period in a mouse. So it, can. Kind of it just look, uh, just, uh, you know, when they are, you can determine when they have breath, you know, can determine embryonic day, and you can expose at those times in neutral. That's true, we can do that. So, I mean, I could imagine, I could have kind of envisaged this project uh, taking two tracks. One is the kind of in vitro side of things where we can more closely manipulate what's going on and have better control over dosage and this kind of thing. You know, we can use more doses and make 
it's easier to manipulate and then at the same time have an in utero approach to show that some of these mechanisms are actually conserved. May I ask my second question? Yeah. That relates to uh, the uh, cadmium. By the way, you are so lucky to have such a brilliant genetic student working on the cadmium. I agree. But, uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, the experiments, and the, I was actually shocked to hear that people in Germany were supposed to help me. I thought these terrible things only happened in Michigan. Um, I was wondering, um, what is the sample sizes of the, those people? How many people are you talking about when you sample cadmium? And the other thing is that clearly their, their exposures must be varied among that group. Uh, wherever the cadmium comes from, it comes from drinking water. I don't know if that is the source of from somewhere else, some drink more, some drink other, some people drink bottle water when they're pregnant and they live in this region. So there must be a lot of variation there. Yes. And then you probably yes. also have among the, these uh, methylation patterns in the control population of pregnant women who may be exposed to yes. all kinds of different things, <coughs> variation in these patterns. So I'm still wondering about the statistics, even though the p value, I don't know if that is a monthronic corrected p value or how the p value was derived. But how large are these samples, and how much variation in methylation patterns are there yeah. uh, among the two groups? Sure. So there is a lot of variation. So um, first of all, the main route of exposure is through the soil for these individuals. So uh, we suspect that it's kind of inhaled. You know, it's walked into the house, it's dust, and it's inhaled. So that's the kind of primary route of exposure, rather than through drinking water. I mean, Catherine can correct me if it's wrong. Um, in terms of the variation, so the individuals that were selected for whole genome by sulfide sequencing, they were selected based on blood levels of cadmium, rather than, you know, these guys lived in this house and therefore they must be exposed to a, a high level. So they were actually selected based on blood levels. So you can try and kind of control this variation a little bit. And how many did you have? So there are 10 individuals in the control group and 10 individuals in the, the exposed group. But I think this is part of the reason that we need the mouse model, because sure, like the humans are exposed to a whole bunch of other factors and toxic metals, and um, sure the data are corrected for many other <coughs> parameters, but I think having a mouse will give us a system where we can be a bit more. There's even a better model than a mouse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 I know. <Yeah. laughs> I have no answer. Lots of individuals. Is that a question? <laughs> no, it's a suggestion. <laughs> No, I think that's it. So um, we've, been, we've been talking with Shan Chan and uh, Logan right. about that because I know that you guys are doing this cabinet exposure so You can have like a fly, mouse, human. The only difference, of course, is that flies you don't see the methylation. That's a different mechanism. That's true. Yep. That is there. Potentially, it's possible that you have similar <coughs> evolutionarily conserved target genes that are epigenetically regulated, albeit one different. by methylation, the other yep. by histone modification. Have you guys done the done like whole transcriptome analysis yet on the uh, I believe that she I don't know how far Trudy knows more how far Sean so this was analyzing the data. Uh, I don't know if she has done already the RNA seq. Oh okay. okay. We're getting pretty close. Okay. I think it does she should be finishing the project up soon. We should let talk to her. Yeah, it's time for another coffee I think. <laughs> Has anyone ever demonstrated the substitution of cadmium for zinc in vivo in the same finger proteins? Uh, I don't know, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's the But shown in vitro, though. Yeah, I'm aware of in vitro studies, but I'm not aware of any in vivo studies. You mentioned trying to tease out the issue of you know, individual susceptibility to adverse events in the world. And I just wonder what kind of approaches you're taking to address that. Yeah, so we're, we're suspecting that it's some kind of um, combination of factors. So, you know, we have a load of data on. So I guess everybody is implemented in humans, so they have the same genetic background. We try to control for maternal age, so when we make them, they're all at the similar age. But there's clearly going to be some biological noise in how much weight they gain. We're not talking about mothers here. Um, you know, their blood leptin levels, uh, the litter sizes, we can control as soon as they're born, of course, how many individuals there are, but we can't control that in utero. And so what we're looking at is trying to um, put all of these data together and see if there are a combination of factors which 
maybe increase susceptibility to the disease, uh, to the um, onset of the disorder. So, uh, yeah, we're doing um, mixed linear modeling to, to try and tease that out. And the second question. It seems to me, at least, if you look at, for example, the uh, stuff coming out of Michael Skinner's lab, uh, where he's thrown a lot of chemicals at mice and thought that the genetic complications with reproductive consequences. It, it almost seems like if you give them enough of something, they're going to respond in that manner. Do you think that just the entire phenomenon of you know, chemicals causing epigenetic changes is, is just kind of an overexpressed response? Having something specific to that chemical? It could be, but I'm wondering if, um, you know, a lot of those examples are these very high doses of, of chemical. And so I'm wondering if, um, you know, when we're talking about human relevant levels, like in Catherine's cadmium study, <coughs> uh, you know, maybe if we dose animals with these lower levels, perhaps produce some more targeted effects. Um, so, I mean, it would be very interesting to compare between different exposure systems. Like, for example, when we do the, uh, even with the embryonic stem cell model, we were exposed to different endocrine disruptors and ask if it's just a, you know, the same pathways are being misregulated or to uh, targets that are unique to me. I mean, certainly lots of, you know, as we said, lots of chemicals actually converge and cause the same types of phenotypes, right? So it could well be that they converge on a similar pathway and affect the same kinds of genes. Yeah. With regard to SP1, um, that was a, a, a computational structural change you saw that they <coughs> predicted in That's the right. second same finger. And you said you, know, you were going to like, maybe try to use chip or something to look at in vivo for binding changes. Do you really expect it not to be binding? And number one, number two, if it wasn't, if it was disrupting binding with SP1, you would have a whole bunch of really very serious effects. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, I'm sure that I mean SP1 has a whole bunch of other targets that yeah. could somehow feed back to this, which is global. <laughs> Um, but I, yeah, I, think I mean, it looks to me like it's probably still capable of buying it, I would bet. I'm, I'm sure it has some capability to buy, I'm not sure. But Perhaps it does have some capability to buy, but I think with chip we can quantitate it about it, so we can ask if there's a reduction in, in binding. Um, I mean, I think the fact that we see a reduction in DNA methyltransferase gene expression perhaps implies that there is a reduced binding of the transcription factor. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a model that we need to test. <coughs> Any other questions? John? Curious, I, I, correct me if I'm just misremembering, but I'm thinking of that sort of classic story from mice, I believe, about maker genomic conflict with these current work. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I mean, so I guess do you foresee if you disrupt? It seems like in some cases some carefully balanced expression you know, between two parental alleles. I mean, do you predict health consequences from that? Um, I don't know if it's necessarily the, you know, the balance or the conflict between the two, two alleles necessarily, but um, you know, I think this is all about dosage control. And so if you, you know, have a relaxation of imprinting, and I mean, so for example, actually, if you look back at the uh, GRP10 gene, So actually the protein that gets produced from both the maternal and the paternal transcripts is the same. Right? So I think you know, if you have a relaxation of imprinting such that now you know, maybe cadmium has inappropriately activated this particular transcript um, where it wouldn't normally be expressed, then now you're just increasing the overall dose of protein that's available. And you know, we know that when you mess around with levels of GRP10, for example, why by knocking it out or causing subtle overexpression, you can definitely have kind of fairly major impacts on development of physiology. Um, so I don't know if it necessarily comes back to this kind of like ratio of you know, an intergenomic conflict, but um, I can definitely see how changing the dosage could be For what then are you What then, I mean, what was like that? Was like the idea of like GM2, right? Yeah. And the so inactivating egg from the mother. So, you know, altering um, embryonic growth. So if you have... I'm asking a speculative problem, but it seems to be best. Yeah, I mean, that's so yeah. good. I mean, GRB10, for example, um, I think acts in a similar kind of antagonistic pathway with another image gene called GLK1, similar to the IGF2, IGF2R for example. Uh, and so, yeah, if you operate one without operating the other, then absolutely now you do have this, I see what you mean, you do have this kind of intragenomic conflict now. Yeah.
Anything else?